Good afternoon. So uh, welcome to the first session of This is Film, Film Heritage in Practice, uh, edition 2022. My name is Giovanna Fossati. I'm the chief curator here at iFilm Museum and uh, professor of film heritage and digital film culture at the University of Amsterdam. After having cancelled the 2020 edition due to the lockdown and having moved the 2021 edition online, we are of course extremely happy to host once again This is Film in I. This year's series will also be made available online with a few weeks delay, whereas a selection of the film screened during the sessions will be available on the I uh, film player. Uh, this is Film uh, is a collaboration started in 2015 between I Film Museum, the University of Amsterdam, and the Amsterdam School for Cultural Analysis. In particular, the series is carried out with the master students uh, of the This is Film class, who help introducing uh, uh, our guests and posing them uh, questions. So a special welcome to the students uh, following This is Film this year. My talk today will uh, focus on the overarching theme of this year's edition, uh, which is global audiovisual archiving. This will also be the theme of the uh, international uh, conference convening here at the end of May. Today, we feel that working together towards uh, a global approach to audiovisual heritage is one of the most urgent challenges for our field. In the digital space, an alarming misrepresentation of our global audiovisual heritage is occurring. Whereas audiovisual archives and research institutions in richer countries, especially in Europe and North America, are eagerly digitizing their own national heritage, their counterparts in low and middle um, income countries in Asia, Africa and Latin America are just at the beginning of the digitization process. As a consequence, heritage from these countries is hardly visible for audiences online, and most researchers and curators focus on audiovisual collections that are preserved, digitized, and made accessible by archives in Europe and North America. The COVID-19 pandemic has made global disparity even clearer. What can be done to turn the tide? The increasing demand for online presence of audiovisual heritage collections from researchers, curators, and audiences in general offers a potential opportunity to rebalance access across borders and economies. However, online presence until now has privileged the archives that, that, are, uh, that have already been digitized uh, and uh, have a digital infrastructure in place. So global disparity has instead increased in the digital space. Recent tragedies, like the fire at uh, Cinemateca Brasileira in Sao Paulo, a crisis that we will discuss in details during the third session of This is Film on April 6, the unknown fate of uh, Afghan film and in Kabul, and the current tragic events in Ukraine, where our colleagues at the Dovchenko National Center in Kyiv find themselves under attack in an uh, outrageous war that uh, is leaving us here in constant search for ways to help and support. These events are pushing our community to search for ways to help our colleagues in need overcome national perspectives, and unite under a more global vision of our field. I think this view uh, is shared by many, as it transpires from the discussions uh, taking place within uh, the archives, archival associations, uh, by our colleagues, fellow researchers, uh, students. At this point, more than ever, we feel a sense of urgency. The clock is ticking as audiovisual heritage that is not digitized in the near future 
even when it is preserved in an analog form, risks becoming unmapped, unresearched, uncurated, unseen, in short, invisible. A radical change in approach to research uh, and practice is needed before it is too late. To start, researchers and professionals involved in audiovisual archiving worldwide need to work together and develop new approaches to make digitization and related research activities an all-inclusive endeavor. Second, new archival methodologies should be developed that are informed by specific contexts, leading to a novel global audiovisual archival theory for guiding research and curatorship aimed at preservation, presentation and access. In this effort, sustainable practices and standards for digitization and digital preservation for countries and archives that are lagging behind should be explored, as well as more environmentally sound alternatives in terms of policies and practices for those archives that are already ahead in the digitization process. Also, to truly obtain a representation of a global audiovisual culture within programming of cinematheque, festivals, and more generally online, we need to increase the digital availability uh, of films from underrepresented countries and support a structural system of collaboration and exchange between film archives worldwide. Finally, a solid basis to promote long-term knowledge exchange between scholars and archivists of both regions should be established. This ambitious agenda requires further contextualization. In recent years, uh, many audiovisual archives and research institutions in countries uh, with a budget for cultural heritage, again, especially in Europe and North America, are actively digitizing, focusing on their own national heritage. An example of such uh, projects is the, uh, in the non-profit uh, sphere is the um, uh, project Images for the Future here in the Netherlands and the project Unlocking uh, the Film Heritage at the British uh, uh, Film Institute. While even in Europe and North America only a fraction of all analog audiovisual collections have been digitized, these initiatives have helped set up digital infrastructures, knowledge centers, and workflows that will allow steady progress in the digitization and digital access of collections, mainly carried out on a national level. Because of the uh, digitization delay in many countries and non-institutional archives, and due to the limited knowledge exchange in the academic and archival community, audiovisual heritage from outside Europe and North America and outside larger institutional archives is often inaccessible for researchers and curators and is unfortunately excluded from research projects and curatorial efforts. In the last two decades, research on the cultural, political, economic and practical consequences of the digitization of audiovisual archives, uh, again in Europe and North America, led to theory forming focused mainly on developments in these regions and based on film and media frameworks that originate from European and North American theoretical discourses. This has been the case with my own research in the transition from analog to digital in film archives and the underlying theoretical frameworks. At first, I accepted the exclusion of researching theories and practices outside Europe as a necessary choice of scope. Later on, I have become increasingly frustrated with this limitation to the point that today, I consider filling this gap as the most important challenge for the entire audiovisual field. In academia, approaches privileging the traditional film canon and the film as art discourse have been uh, long rediscussed. 
but they are still central to the institutional strategy and national uh, subsidies rationales from which institutions can hardly escape. In Europe, for instance, where audiovisual archives and museums are often subsidized and have a solid relationship with funding entities, most heritage institutions have built their preservation policy around concepts of national heritage. Some very important and exemplary projects should be mentioned here that have uh, pointed to, uh, towards a different, more global and collaborative approach to film archival practice and research. A few examples will be discussed in the next three months uh, during the six sessions of uh, This is Film. These are the work uh, carried out in Lebanon by the Metropolis Cinema Association, focus of today's session with our guest Noor Waida, the Audiovisual Preservation Exchange Project, active in Latin America and Africa since 2008, will be discussed with our guest uh, Juana Suarez in the second session on March 23. As mentioned earlier, the difficult situation of uh, film heritage in Brazil and the uh, international support that has followed this crisis uh, will be discussed uh, with Ines Eisengart Menenzes uh, on April 6. The work carried out by archives in Southeast Asia, part partnering in the Southeast Asia Pacific Audiovisual Archive Association will be our focus on April 20 with Karen Chan, director of the um, Asian Film uh, Archive uh, in Singapore. On May 5, uh, we will talk with Abubakar Sanogo uh, about the African Film Heritage Project, uh, a partnership between uh, FEPACI, the Film Foundation and UNESCO. And finally, the efforts of uh, rediscovering forgotten makers, such as uh, Indonesian filmmaker Ratna Asmara, will be presented by film archivist uh, Li Lisabona Raman and film critic Umi Lestari on May 18, during the sixth and final session of uh, um, the series. So, <coughs> What can we learn from these and similar initiatives about effective uh, global approaches to film uh, archiving? How would a global approach change audiovisual archival practices of acquisition, selection, cataloging, preservation, restoration, access, curation and presentation? How would that in turn affect the programming of film museums and streaming platforms? What kind of content would be available online for audiences, education, reuse, if online access would truly represent a global film history? I hope uh, to continue this uh, con conversation during the sessions of This is Film in the coming weeks and during the I International Conference. Um, it will take place uh, at the end of May, uh, here in I, uh, postponed by one year due to the pandemic. Uh, the I International Conference, the seventh edition, um, will uh, uh, focus on global audiovisual archiving exchange in knowledge and practices. The conference will uh, work with the, an advisory board that includes experts, active in various countries in Latin America, Africa, and Asia, including all the guest speakers who have been invited for the series uh, uh, This is Film. We will gather online and in person more than 50 speakers from uh, very diverse uh, realities, from within and outside of uh, formalized institutions uh, uh, worldwide, and we hope to facilitate the creation of a network for the long-term exchange of knowledge and learning that is so much needed. So now, I would like to introduce uh, um, Cody Kenner, Maud Kisling, Vera Menendez, Yuli Peters, eh, who are uh, uh, students of This is Film, and uh, uh, on behalf of the group, uh, Vera will introduce uh, our guest today. 
Um, yes. <laughs> Hi, my name is Vera and I'm going to introduce our uh, guest of today, uh, Noor Oida. Uh, Noor Oida is uh, a filmmaker, um, film critic and a programmer from Beirut, Lebanon. Um, she is a deputy, deputy uh, director at the uh, Metropolis Cinema Association uh, in Beirut, where she's uh, managing uh, the Cinematheque Beirut uh, project. And she is co-editor of the Montreal-based um, online film journal Ors Jump. And her own films and writing uh, research the practice of uh, drifting in cinema. Uh, the Cinematheque Beirut project is an ambitious, uh, ambitious, <laughs> ambitious uh, project uh, that has the goal of becoming a dynamic and innovative uh, platform. Uh, dedicated to the art and preservation of films um, in Beirut, Lebanon, or like in, in Lebanon, uh, um, and from Lebanon. Uh, and it continues the Metropolis Cinema Association's efforts uh, to promote uh, Lebanese cinema and history uh, and document Lebanese filmmaking. Uh, the project's mission is to uh, preserve Lebanon's film and non-film archives uh, collect data on these archives in order to develop uh, a public online database, uh, assist researchers uh, in the publication, for example, uh, specialist books uh, and their, uh, their studies, uh, and support the local uh, film scene by devel devel <laughs> developing a, a platform that will uh, showcase both um, productions made in the past and the present. And now I want to give the stage or the screen to, uh, to Noor. So, yeah, thank you. Yes, hello. Um, so thank you very much uh, for this lovely invitation. I'm very happy to be uh, here well, virtually with all of you. Um, so uh, I would like to uh, focus the small presentation that I'm going to do uh, today uh, to just give a bit of context um, around uh, film productions and film archives uh, in Lebanon. Um, I'm not a historian, uh, I'm a little bit of a researcher, uh, so everything that I'm giving is, uh, is, is um, a reading uh, that I'm doing uh, on certain things uh, with uh, consultations from other historians and uh, certain books that are written on Lebanese cinema. Um, so I would like to uh, share with you, I'm going to share my screen. All right. Um, so whenever I, I want to talk a little bit about the various histories of uh, cinema in Lebanon, I always uh, like to start here uh, with this uh, video um, or uh, digitization of a film reel, um, which is a part of the Lumière catalog, uh, which was shot in the, what was known as the Place des Canons, uh, the Burj Square, which is today uh, in the middle of Beirut, uh, called the, um, the Martyr Square. Uh, it was shot by a Lumière operator uh, called Alexandre Tromio uh, in April uh, 1897, uh, during one of the trips uh, in the to document uh, the um, uh, various landscapes and uh, cities in the Ottoman Empire. So these are uh, considered to be the first images shot in Beirut uh, in the heart of the city. Um, so just see passers-by. And uh, this is actually, um, so at that point, Lebanon was uh, still under the Ottoman Empire. And obviously, uh, the reason why these images still exist, whereas uh, other films that were made uh, 30 or 40 years later uh, are still not to be found, is because they are part of a French archive. So, um, also, I would like to note that it is on this square uh, that the first cinemas uh, appeared in Lebanon in uh, around 1909, 1910. Um, and, and we had to wait until 1929 uh, for uh, the first uh, film to be produced that is considered to be uh, 
Lebanese film. Uh, it is, even though it was directed by an Italian, so the film is called The Adventures of Elias Mabrouk. It's uh, directed by a filmmaker called Giordano Pidutti. And uh, it is considered to be a Lebanese film uh, because it was produced by the Compagnie Cinematographique Libanaise, which is considered to be the first production house managed by Pidutti himself and Edouard Farhi. Uh, and also because of uh, the fact that the actors were Lebanese uh, and the subject, uh, it was shot in Lebanon, and the subject is a typically Lebanese uh, subject, which is uh, a man the story of a man that comes back from his exile in the United States uh, to find out that his country has changed drastically. So from the beginning, um, the, the questions that we start to ask ourselves is uh, within the, hy the hybridity of the modes and conditions of production, what do we consider a Lebanese film? How, what are the criteria that we use to define a Lebanese film? Because if we want to start thinking of preserving some kind of national uh, film heritage, if that is the goal, for example, uh, what are we including and what are we excluding? Uh, in 1933, uh, the film uh, In the Ruins of Baalbek was produced. Uh, it is the first sound film. Uh, and uh, with it appears uh, one of the first DOPs in cameraman called George Costi. Um, and both uh, these films and uh, the one made in 1929 were produced before the, independ the Lebanese uh, independence from the French mandate, uh, which happened in 1943. So between uh, 1929 and the year 2000, the year 2000, so in the span of 61 years, there was around 500 films produced. And another 500 were produced between 2000 and um, 2022, so today. Uh, this is, uh, uh, this uh, comes to show that it took a long time for the industry to kind of get kick-started. And for a, a while, what was really working commercially in Lebanon was to import um, uh, Egyptian films and to uh, produce uh, films that, uh, where the actors would speak in, in Egyptian dialects to export to Egypt because the market there uh, was much more lucrative. So it was around the Martyr Square. Uh, this is an image of the Martyr Square uh, at night uh, in the 1930s where we can see the Roxy Cinema and the Ampir Cinema. The Ampir Cinema is one of the oldest uh, a still running uh, cinema circuits in Lebanon. It just celebrated its 100 year anniversary in 2019. Uh, and uh, so it was really around the square that uh, uh, the, the, there was the biggest concentration of um, movie theaters. Uh, and then it moved into different neighborhoods in the city, uh, notably, for example, the Hamra neighborhood uh, in the 1960s. Uh, there was a very big concentration of movie theaters in Lebanon, in Beirut, sorry, uh, that were showing films from various genres, uh, international, but also local and regional, uh, co uh, commercial films, but also uh, auteur films. Uh, and this also um, showed that uh, the movie going experience was a very important one uh, in Lebanon uh, also. Uh, in the 19, uh, in the early 1960s, um, there was uh, an activity, a cinema activity that started called the, the uh, Cine Club, basically a Cine, Cine Club de Beirut, um, that wanted to screen non-commercial films and especially uh, to have uh, guests, uh, filmmakers, and debates. So to propose a cultural offer that's different than the ones that we see on the uh, in the movie theaters around town. Uh, it was basically, we can consider it to be the first art house film program, um, at least curated as such. And uh, in 1969, uh, the document, uh, the scans that we see here are actually from uh, the official registration uh, of the Cine Club de Beirut as the Cinematheque Libanaise or the Museum of Cinema uh, as an independent non-governmental association in 1969. Uh, and so this never really uh, materialized, but it, we, can, we can see that it's one of the first attempts to um, 
to collect uh, and to create a collection of uh, Lebanese films um, and a permanent museum of cinema. They wanted, uh, for example, to acquire at least one copy of each Lebanese film and uh, if they can, original copies when possible. Uh, this is uh, defined in the different points that we see here in the scan. Walid Shmet, which is a film historian that also, uh, and a programmer that also worked with the Cine Club de Beirut, uh, has once uh, said in an interview that um, they did have film prints and a collection. Uh, they were in, um, in an office uh, in, uh, uh, in Beirut, uh, but in 1975, uh, actually, in the beginning of the wars, there was a fire that destroyed all the prints due to a shell that fell nearby. So this um, this attempt kind of uh, well uh, didn't didn't work out in that sense, uh, and the infrastructure disappeared. Uh, another important uh, milestone when it comes to locating and disseminating. Um, film production in Lebanon is uh, Walid Schmidt, so the, the historian, the film historian. His program, he produced a program on Tele Liban, uh, which is the public uh, Lebanese television channel. Uh, the program was called The History of Lebanese Cinema, and it ran between 1972 and 1973, and included 14 episodes that aired during prime time on Sundays after the evening news. And because of this program, uh, Walid Schmidt was able to uh, locate certain copies of films uh, that uh, were not particularly uh, available uh, in order to screen them. Uh, and it was also the occasion um, to uh, invite uh, guests to have a conversation around the film. Um, unfortunately, the archive of this television show is part of the Tele Liban archives, which are in a disastrous state and completely inaccessible. Uh, they do have an office in Beirut, but there's a complete opacity on uh, exactly the, the amount of uh, reels or tapes that are present there and their state. Uh, yes, uh, okay. Um, so I think one of the most important experiences um, when it comes to uh, attempts or projects uh, around the preservation of uh, film heritage in Lebanon uh, is Jocelyn Saab's project, Beirut, A Thousand and One Images. Here we can see the poster of the project, um, which uh, kind of happened in the time frame between 1992 and 1993. Uh, her project was to research uh, films um, shot in Lebanon uh, before uh, the wars, uh, so before uh, 1975. Uh, and uh, uh, what she did is uh, that uh, through the project, she located more than 400 films. Uh, these films included uh, Lebanese film productions, uh, but also any foreign films uh, that were shot in Lebanon uh, or had uh, as a subject um, Beirut or Lebanon, and so tried to represent it in various ways. Um, the about 30 of the 400 films located were restored uh, with the support of the French government, Arte, and the Lebanese, uh, the newly created Lebanese Ministry of Culture. Uh, and these 30 films became the basis of um, a newly found uh, cinematic. Uh, and this was uh, when the Lebanese National uh, Cinematheque, the Cinematheque Nationale Libanaise, was created around 1995. And actually, um, the restoration of these films uh, happened uh, when the project uh, was transformed from a research uh, around images. Uh, from an image research to um, a, a film project uh, where she, re she wanted to re-edit and retell the story of Beirut uh, throughout uh, the history of cinema. Um, uh, and uh, the Cinémathèque Nationale was uh, thus founded uh, as part of the Ministry of Culture and with the support of the UNESCO. Um, and uh, it is currently still existent, and it is the only Lebanese uh, public institution uh, that deals with archive, uh, with, art, with film archives. Uh, but the lack of funding, transparency, and the absence of cultural part policies related to film heritage um, means that all the other uh, initiatives uh, that 
came to be since then are all private initiatives uh, from various non-governmental associations that had to kind of, uh, as Giovanna was saying earlier, fill in the gaps. So a lot of it was a reaction to the absence of a role that this uh, national cinematheque was not playing. So today uh, we have uh, multiple initiatives. I'm sorry, this is a slide that has a lot of uh, text on it, but I thought I could just give you an idea. Um, so there are film libraries, film and video libraries. Uh, there's also certain uh, initiatives that have uh, film collections um, that are working on doing also restoration work uh, that is either outsourced uh, or there's slowly people being uh, trained to do that uh, in Lebanon. Uh, in-house. Um, and uh, there's also a series of non-film archives uh, that uh, have a collection of either books or posters um, or various uh, documents uh, related to Lebanese cinema. Um, and in, in this regard, I would like to tackle a little bit the question of um, the status of an archive, so public versus private. So what is the nature of the film archive that uh, we are dealing with? Is it public? Is it private? Because public archives that are mostly national archives generally respond to specific cultural policies geared towards a certain exhaustivity. And of course, in a lot of cases, in a lot of countries follow very specific political agendas. So any change towards a more conservative or nationalistic government can put the whole archive and its accessibility in danger. Uh, if that um, since that that government decides, uh, sorry, so it can put the whole archive and its accessibility in danger. Since that government decides what can be considered part of the national filmography and what will be forcibly left out and erased. However, an archive being part of a public uh, institution gives it a certain status and legitimacy that a lot of filmmakers also look for. It's the prestige of being part of a filmography of your country, of your work being recognized as part of a cinematic history and memory. It also gives access when that is available to a certain kind of funding uh, that is difficult to access otherwise. And many filmmakers want this kind of record don't this kind of recognition. And in parallel, public archives need certain key films to constitute a complete, uh, this is between uh, brackets, uh, national filmography. At the same time, I find the privatization of this whole sector uh, very dangerous, which is almost the case uh, in Lebanon at the moment. Because the questions that we start to ask ourselves is to whose advantage is it to preserve or restore a certain film? Who is making money out of this restoration? And these factors start to determine which films will be restored and which will not, and how it will influence the way restor the restoration is undertaken if it responds, for example, um, to certain uh, rules or, uh, how do you say, uh, demands of the market uh, without taking into consideration ethical uh, questions. Okay, um, so I'd like to try to contextualize a little bit the Metropolis Cinema Association and Cinematic Beirut within this whole landscape. Um, so I, I, I've been working with Metropolis uh, since 2018, and I manage the Cinematic Beirut project. Metropolis uh, is an association dedicated to showing and supporting international, regional, and local independent films in Lebanon. Uh, and it is a project by Metropolis, uh, that, uh, Cinematic Beirut is a project by Metropolis that was launched in 2018. And it comprises of a film heritage program, a database, an online database uh, that's open and accessible uh, of Lebanese films, uh, and a series uh, of oral uh, and video interviews about Lebanese cinema. And we are currently working uh, on uh, to materialize this project in a into a physical space with an archive and a film library. Uh, one of the questions here that we start to ask ourselves also is, uh, in what direction do we uh, want to develop this archive? Because we are not, um, how do you say, we don't have our we don't have a collection already that determines our very um, 
uh, our needs or the scale of, uh, of our space. Uh, so we kind of have to do things the other way around uh, and think of uh, what is the cur our curatorial line when it comes to acquiring um, uh, films or creating uh, an archive, a collection. Um, so, as I was saying, uh, Cinematheque Beirut is not an archive yet. Uh, our interest in film heritage preservation derives from our desire to circulate uh, Lebanese film productions to diverse audiences. Uh, and I think that this is an important point uh, to mention because this is our uh, entry point. Uh, so through programming from Heritage, it's a continuation of uh, work that Metropolis has been doing since its inception in 2006. Um, so, and we can talk about this a bit later, uh, but uh, the idea is um, that programming becomes the, the gateway uh, to curating um, a collection uh, because also in, there's a reality that programming allows uh, to create a pretext to find funds to restore certain films. Um, and it is, I think it is always important uh, to think about restoration and preservation um, in regards to its uh, exhibition uh, because I don't see the point of restoring and preserving a film if it will never be shown, of course. So another way um, to activate an archive uh, is to repurpose its images through found footage works. So right now I'm gonna uh, take the example of the film that you will um, see uh, in a bit. Uh, which is called Topol Topology of an Absence, uh, made by Rami Sabah and Sharif Sahnawi uh, in 2021. Uh, this work is based on archival footage from the 1920s, uh, captured in Lebanon by uh, operators uh, from Pate and Gomon. Um, it was produced as a commission uh, by the festival Asmondo in Strasbourg. Rami Sabah, who's a filmmaker and an editor, Sharif Sahnawi, Abed Baisi, and Gregory Darjan, who are musicians, were given access to these images that are preserved at the Pate Gaumont archives in France. Uh, they were uh, commissioned to create um, an audiovisual uh, musical uh, uh, piece uh, around and inspired from these archives. One of the first um, and uh, instructions uh, or questions was uh, if, uh, sorry, no, one, uh, at first it was Sharif Sahnawi, the musician that was approached for this project. And the first idea was to um, just select a few sequences and shots from that archive uh, and just edit them chronologically and for uh, musicians to create a soundtrack from them, uh, but the idea was pushed furthermore uh, to try uh, to propose uh, a work and an edit of these images, um, to try to push it more uh, beyond just a selection. And uh, it was then that Rami Sabah uh, was brought on board through Sharif Sahnawi. And very, like, when we look at an archive like that, it's the same as uh, the first video um, that I was showing of uh, the Lumière operators, is that the, really the only reason moving images of Beirut in the 1920s still exist today is that they were filmed by Pate and Gaumont operators uh, and preserved at these archives. So at the time, Lebanon was under the French mandate and obviously these images were tools for shaping colonial imaginaries. And uh, when Rami Sabah, in, in a discussion uh, around this uh, project, um, was telling me a bit about his first encounter with uh, these images, uh, saying that he was um, kind of uh, traversed by two very different and opposed uh, emotions, uh, which are emotions, uh, a feeling of fascination 
as these images, as if these images were uh, a miraculous apparition uh, coming from a time uh, that he had no access to, uh, and an anger at how these images are not images that we are bored of. They're not images that we have seen so many times uh, uh, that have that are part of, for example, uh, the that we, we see, for example, every year on the Independence Day uh, as part of the Tele Liban, the national television channel uh, programs. Um, so Rami, uh, Rami Sabah was given access to these images only because he had this link to this festival and to, uh, that had the link with Pate and Gumo. And one of the things uh, I think that is very telling here is how fragile and precarious this chain of who knows who and who gives access to who. It's almost by chance, uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna say by chance, but through like, um, let's say by chance, yes. Uh, it's almost by chance that uh, uh, Sharif Sahnawi was approached and then he uh, suggested Rami and Rami Sabah was given access to these images that he, if he wasn't available, for example, for this project, he would have never seen. So here also, uh, um, I think it, it raises the question of what really happens when we discover Im such images, uh, images that are supposed to be uh, part of our collective uh, uh, history, our collective and personal history. And most of the time, the discovery of images like that is the discovery of an absence. It's a discovery of, um, of a gap uh, in uh, the, the, the sequence of um, images that are relating to the history of the place that we live in. So the absence is not only of these images from, as I said, our collective and personal histories, but it is what we're discovering is also the absence of these images from our public archives. So, <clears throat> one of the things uh, that Rami Sabah tried uh, to do when dealing with these images is to um, is to not consider uh, these images as images from the past. So they're not images of heritage or of, they don't form a patrimony, let's say, a patrimoine, uh, but to look at them uh, as images uh, from, uh, as images of uh, the present and us being located uh, in these images future. So, basically uh, changing the way or the position, the positioning from which uh, we are looking at these images from. In the film, you will see uh, that in the middle of the film, there is a shot of the sea. This shot is not from the Pate Gomo archive. It is filmed uh, by uh, Rami Sabah uh, today, well, last year. Uh, he considers this image uh, to be an apparition from the future. Uh, if the, the archival images are considered the present, the sea is coming from the future uh, of these uh, Gomo and Pate uh, images. And uh, as you see here, for example, uh, the first image is um, of the port of Beirut, uh, which is part of the Gomo and Pate archives. And then the second image is uh, the image of the sea that I was talking about. And because this image becomes an apparition, the way the film functions is that it creates a rupture within the film, a disruption after which a series of portraits appear. Uh, and these series of portraits are from the Pate Gomo archives uh, that will be slowly and slowly uh, degraded as we see in the last image. So here the proposition is that after this apparition, the archives cannot continue as if nothing happened. They are not bystanders. From a colonial point of view, the images shot in the colonies are representation. 
they are not uh, they they are given no agency to affect the viewer and here what is happening is that when they encounter an apparition such as the, the image in the middle uh, it allows them uh, they, they become affected by it and haunted by it and it allows them to encounter uh, other images that are shot in different times and this is what we see uh, at the end of the film so here we see that the, the found footage practices uh, uh, become also a way uh, of um, unlearning uh, the positions uh, in which we are in, uh, the positions of access, uh, and uh, trying to uh, understand certain archives and images uh, from a different uh, from a different perspective and to try to unhinge them and subvert them, revealing new meanings and new affects. I'm always, I find it always quite funny uh, when we talk about found footage, when in fact really the, the subject of our relationship with archives is not one of finding things, but it is one of, uh, it is a relationship of absence uh, and erasure. Um, so, yes. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Noor. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you are uh, see. Do you see me? Yes. Yeah, great. I'm sorry the way the cameras are placed. You don't see the audience, but there is a nice audience be can, in front of you. <laughs> I will imagine. That. So thank you very much uh, for uh, your presentation. Uh, we are going to move in a second to um, uh, questions. Um, I just uh, a, a quick reflection. I find uh, extremely um, intriguing to think of um, uh, with, with, with the example uh, uh, you just mentioned, and we are going to screen uh, 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 in a little bit here, uh, to think of um, the practice of uh, uh, found footage filmmaking, which is, of course, a practice of reappropriation, when it is reappropriation of colonial footage, really. So it's a double reappropriation. It's reappropriation of footage to make, to create a new film, but it's reappropriation of footage that in a way belongs to you or to your, although as you, as you point out, these images are uh, alien because they, they are kept, ma made from somewhere else, I mean made there by someone else and kept somewhere else, but still uh, the, the, this process of reappropriate also the image, which, which kind of ties in with this uh, uh, ongoing discussion on what does it mean to decolonize film collections, uh, which is something we are just starting within our field to really discuss, because uh, it's uh, simple to say we, uh, if a painting has been taken somewhere else, it's time to to. Re, 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 uh, give it back, repatriate it. But how do you do with film, where the images are taken somewhere else, but the film itself is he is made by a French production in this case? So I find it extremely uh, interesting. And this brings me to uh, the first question. Uh, hi, Nero. Thank you very much for this presentation. It was really interesting. Um, my uh, question concerns the, the film Topology of an Absence, uh, which is based on archival footage. And we were wondering what uh, tactics might a director, uh, even an archive, employ to subvert a colonial gaze from imperial powers in the use of archival footage? Yes, um, I think that I, I uh, <laughs> talked a little bit about this when I was talking about the the image of the sea, but there is another example uh, or gesture that I can talk about. Um, so uh, also during a discussion with the filmmaker, with Rami Sabah, um, I was asking him, uh, he had very short time to work on the video, um, on the edit, 
Uh, and so he had to kind of make uh, in uh, discussions with uh, the musicians, make very fast decisions on how to navigate and circulate this archive. He also had a very um, distant access to them. Uh, he was given low quality access uh, online to the images. Uh, and uh, he was only given, uh, after he made the edit, he, was, he had to um, indicate the time codes. And after that, he was given uh, the, the high quality images. Uh, so there was a, a, a first gesture, which is uh, to try um, to kind of, uh, how, how do I say this? So for, so we know the context uh, in which the images, these images were made. Um, and as I think as a first gesture, what he uh, told me he wanted to do was to try to rip these images from <laughs> their colonial context. Uh, one of like, the simple uh, examples uh, in which he, uh, that he did uh, is that he started by selecting, he decided to discard any image uh, in which the French flag appears. Uh, for example, uh, I think there is, uh, when I was watching the film, I saw that it appears in one of the shots. I have to ask him again about that shot. Um, but uh, basically uh, he wanted to erase uh, the presence, uh, the official presence of the French uh, through their official buildings and their flag and um, their institutions. Uh, and, and here there's a bit two um, point of views that can, that can collide, let's say. Uh, there's a position that Ram Yusabar is, is taking, which is um, to uh, erase all context uh, and to kind of, uh, he sees it as a liberation of the images from the weight of that history. But on another end, uh, uh, not giving these images their context is also maybe uh, invisibilizing a certain layer of violence that wouldn't otherwise appear unless we know this context. Um, so I don't have a solution here as what to do, but these are two different uh, approaches, let's say, to, uh, uh, to either, uh, how do you say, reinforce the context or to invisibilize it. And, and that takes me a little bit to, to something, also maybe to, um, to bounce back on something uh, Giovanna was saying, so I, I think one of the biggest discussions today around film archives is around reappropriation, uh, around repatriation. And uh, there's something uh, that Rami Sabah says uh, when talking about his, this film is that he doesn't see his gesture as a reappropriation because he doesn't think that these images belong to him. The idea of these images belonging to anyone is exactly the violence that is imposed on them. So the idea is to liberate them from uh, their status of being a commodity, of being something that can be given or taken back. Um, so, and, and I feel that this is a very interesting uh, approach, or not interesting, but a very stimulating. Uh, thought uh, process. Uh, and I think that maybe one of the ways if we want to think about decolonizing uh, uh, film archives is, is to, to try to, to break that constant cycle of, um, of belonging, of uh, not belong, of, of appropriation and reappropriation and uh, and here, one of the interesting structures that we can think of, and this is something that is um, more and more thought of these days, is, is how can we think of archives outside of the national, uh, not think of national archives, but of transnational archives, of thematic archives, which do exist, um, but how can these uh, places become uh, the site of discourse around uh, archival practices or film practices. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm giving the floor back to Giovanna now. Thank you. 
thank you, Noor. Uh, uh, these last uh, thoughts about um, appropriation, reappropriation, and giving back these images to a kind of freedom in a way <laughs> and, a more trans in, and a more transnational uh, approach. Um, sounds great. And uh, um, uh, before moving to the, to the screening, I'd like to see if there are more questions from the audience. Hello, thank you for your presentation. Uh, uh, can you reflect on how to uh, perceive the wealth accumulated through the plunder and exploitation of uh, the images in uh, by, by the uh, colonial archives or the Western uh, agencies and countries uh, coming and uh, creating these uh, films. Like, how, what's the? How will you? How will we materialize? Uh, the wealth that is only beneficial to one side or yeah how yeah what's what's the uh, what's the harm done or what's the uh, wealth accumulated by the makers but not the subjects mm -hmm. i think for example in the case of the French uh, that were sending camera operators here during the Monday. There's always this, um, well, already the, the camera operators are in a position, are given the responsibility of uh, documenting, I'm gonna put it like that, but the acquired land, <laughs> let's say. Uh, so what they are recording is, it, it's an indication of what um, they have power over. So for example, we control this city, these people, these buildings, this land. Uh, so I guess one point, and, and, and this adds on to uh, their own like capital. Um, and becomes an extension uh, of, of their image uh, and their power. Um, but I think that um, in, in, in terms of harm done, I think it's always in, in, in For example, in the case of these images, it's how calm they seem, for example. Uh, you, you'll see now in the film, they're like very, like the, uh, the frames are very like set, life seems to be happening, everything is very fluid, uh, people are just living their lives. And it completely erases, um, all the power dynamics that are in play within that frame and who's looking at who, you know? So, so I, I guess it's, it's in the, uh, the latency uh, of that violence where I'm gonna say the harm is done, but I don't wanna frame it that way. I don't wanna phrase it that way, but uh, yeah. It's the, the, the fact that these images are so attractive also. They're so beautiful and fascinating. And you kind of want to look at them. And if you don't, if you don't have the context, you're, you fall into the trap. Um, yeah, I, I guess uh, archival images can, can do that. They are. Uh, they, they can be dangerous in that way. <laughs> yeah. As fascinating as they are too. <laughs> Thank you. So in that sense also, maybe it's similar to the 
case of repatriation of objects because they are presented as also beautiful objects but without context it's just yeah, yeah so it's yeah it's in a yeah. similar way maybe yeah uh, in the case of i think in the case of a certain object um a lot of the times uh, i think the contradiction is that a lot of these objects are also used uh, so, so they have they have a use within a certain uh, context and when they are put in in a museum their their value or their well usefulness is erased completely when they become a haida i don't know in this sense what the use of images are <laughs> in that uh, like in that utilitarian sense um, but, but I guess the parallel can be that, for example, these images for me are, even if they exist in this archive at Pate Gaumont in France, if they're not activated somehow, for example, like in a film like that one, if they're not made accessible, it's uh, as if they don't like, uh, what's the use of, of preserving them, of restoring them, of digitizing them? Um, yeah, they're, they're kind, they become, I don't know, uh, relics or something like that. I, I don't know if relics is the right word, but like sacred objects that we cannot touch, whereas they're supposed to be like, uh, seen and seen again and again and again. Yeah, and maybe uh, they to relate to something that you said earlier. They they stay the commodities they were when they mm. were made. Um, in that sense, uh, this discussion is uh, is very interesting interesting because it also shows how complex uh, 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 the matter is within uh, um, archival relations because you have examples of archives take Pate and Gaumont that are. Uh, still the same entities, although very much yeah. changed, uh, that mm -hmm. made those films. Yeah. Then you have all the other uh, archival, similar archival footage that is dispersed in archives uh, in Europe, or uh, and uh, um, and then there is the question: uh, Yeah, how how yeah how how do you? What is the process of restitution for those images? What is the what? The Sorry. process of restitution, of mm, repatriation. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's mm. this course. But indeed, mm. when, when the archives are uh, private archives that are uh, still the kind of the living, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, what remains of the original pro production companies, that complicates things a lot. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we'll continue <laughs> this conversation. Uh, so thank you very much, Noor. Thank you, everybody. We are so uh, now going to move to the screening. But first, uh, um, yeah, Noor, I really uh, look forward to uh, welcoming you here for the conference in a couple of months. Um, and uh, uh, I hope to see you all uh, for the next uh, This Is Film session on March 23. Uh, we with uh, Juana Suarez, who unexpectedly will be here with us uh, um, for the session uh, to talk about film heritage in Latin America and the uh, project Audiovisual uh, Preservation Exchange. So thank you, Noor. Thank you, everybody, and enjoy the thank screening. You, thank you.